Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Smythe, co-chair of Xavier's Sustainability Committee, and I want to thank all of you for coming today. A year ago, when we stood before you, we had recently completed our greenhouse gas inventory, as called for by the President's climate commitment. And we're beginning to write our campus sustainability plan, the most significant requirement of the commitment. Now we have completed our campus sustainability plan. It is available for viewing on our website, and the afternoon presentations and discussions will be devoted to the plan. But here at the beginning of our time together, we wanted to share with you two things. First, our collective accomplishments over the past year in both visual and spoken form. These are actions and plans that are the result of the work of many on campus, not just those of us on the committee. And second, we wanted to share with you the broader framework that has guided our work and that we foresee guiding our work in the next two to three years. But let's begin with a video that outlines some of what we have accomplished. Sustainability is really at the core of who we are as a Jesuit university. Uh, it's a pressing global issue and the mission statement calls us to educate students for social responsibility and that includes sustainability. We kind of have a, a mix of, of people that, that come out. We have some, some faculty and staff and their families, you know, who come out. We have some student groups, we have some individual students, um, and we also have residents of, of both Norwood and Evanston um, who are coming out, who rented a plot and are, are interested in growing their produce here. The new major is the environmental science major. We talked about environmental issues 20 years ago. Certainly there were environmental issues around and people were going into environmental fields. But today it's, those issues are just that much more, that much more critical. Um, and so Xavier felt, it, or that we, we felt, that it was really important to have this major. I have introduced sustainability topics into um, oral communication, which is COM 101. Because it's important uh, to what's happening today in our society and also something that Xavier's focusing on, it gives us that opportunity to help them have an opportunity or a venue to be able to speak out about issues that they believe are important. residence hall and dining complex is being constructed to lead silver standards uh, just like the other buildings in the Hoff Academic Quad just like the Learning Commons and the uh, College of Business uh, you've got a lot of enhanced features for, with um, occupancy sensors and light harvesting and, and, and items like that. The topic I've been using, using recently for the past uh, two or three semesters has been consumption. And we talk about this subject in terms of, this is all through the lens of literature, so we're looking at how individuals, characters consume other people, how we consume our resources, how we consume in other aspects of our life. By the time we get to this film, The Story of Stuff, then, I think they're primed to think about ways in which we kind of consume out of habit. I introduced them to the idea of cradle to cradle, which is making companies responsible for all of the resources that they use, as well as the product after they've sold it to the consumer. We also talk about natural capitalism, which is the idea of using processes found in nature to create materials for our manufacturing of products rather than chemical compounds.
I think people tend to think about sustainability as an extra step that they have to take or something extra that they have to do or something that gets in the way in their life and I don't think that that's what sustainability is. Sustainability is about enriching your life and the lives of others so that we can all live a healthier, happier, more sustainable life. Last year on this occasion, over a hundred people, faculty, staff, and students, brainstormed ideas for making our campus greener. And we're happy to note that many of those ideas have already come to fruition or are in process. For example, there were multiple suggestions regarding integrating sustainability into research and teaching. An environmental sciences major, spearheaded by the Dean of Arts and Sciences and the Biology Department, began this fall as you saw Brent talking about in the video. In addition, the Provost's Office and Associate Provost's Office, along with the Center for Teaching Excellence, are supporting, uh, supporting a faculty fellow on sustainability that provides time off from teaching for a faculty member to design new courses in sustainability. The two courses that are the outcome of that work are being taught this year, Green Urbanism and Urban Gardening and Localization. Next year, there will be more faculty fellow opportunities, including a sustainability fellow again. In addition, the Center for Teaching Excellence, with support of the president, are sponsoring five faculty learning communities, one of which is entitled Incorporating Sustainability into the Curriculum and has members from all three colleges. As a result of new hires, we now have three ecologists on the biology staff, an essential element in helping to build our new major and other related majors in the future. Finally, a sustainability conference titled Economics of Stewardship and Sustainability, sponsored by the Xavier University Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and the Campbell Institute, launches this weekend right here on our campus. There was a call last year for involving more students in sustainability efforts and conversations. With our president's support, we now have three sustainability student interns, Emily Tokolsky, Taylor Morrow, and Laura Wallace, all serving on the committee. They have founded the Sustain Student Sustainability Club to help carry out some of our work. It also serves as a central place for student interest on sustainability. In addition, there are other student organizations on campus, like the Gardening Club, that directly link to our work and plan. We also have an SGA representative on the committee, as we have had from the beginning. The host of activities that are taking place this week and that you can see on our website are a result of student initiative and work, as are many other recent efforts. For example, a student-driven proposal for a voluntary green fee is supported by SGA and has been proposed to the University Planning and Resource Council. In addition, students wrote and distributed a survey on student biking practices, helped to facilitate a greener move-in, organized and hosted several video showings last year, and helped to achieve a 25% increase in recycling in student residence halls during Recycle Mania this past spring. There were several suggestions last year regarding increasing biking to and from campus. We have doubled the number of bike racks on campus in the last two years, and the city has created a bike lane on Dana between Madison and Grigg Avenues that will eventually continue all the way to campus, making it safer to ride from the residential and commercial districts of Hyde Park, Oakley, and Mount Lookout to campus. In addition, Josh, Josh Arthur, a member of SGA and our committee, is undertaking a bike rental program to make bikes more accessible to students. Other suggestions that have come to fruition include promoting vegetarian eating habits, through more options at Ryan's and Meatless Mondays at the Hoff Dining Center. And in addition, we are beginning to link up with other students and other universities. With the University of Cincinnati, Xavier will be participating in the Crosstown Bike Out tomorrow. The Nexus, Norwood, Evanston, Xavier, Urban Sustainability Community Garden has finished its first year with 49 registered gardeners in 30 plots and 198 attendees at 12 workshops and events. Rain gardens have been established along the rail corridor to help capture rain and reduce sewer overflows. And of course, we have two new silver lead equivalent buildings with reflective roofing to reduce energy use. The new dining hall under construction will have a green roof plaza. 
and we received a budget line in this past year's budget and have been part of the budget process from early summer, thus ensuring access to resources to continue our efforts. There is a commitment to significantly reducing our energy use. Physical Plant will be providing metering of both water and electricity usage in the older student residence halls this year so that we can more carefully track use and then educate for more responsible consumption. Furthermore, although we currently have three central utility plants, the newest and most efficient one is in the process to eventually replace the two older, less efficient plants. Clearly, we are a more sustainable campus than we were last year, with a lot of enthusiasm being harnessed to taking us further, faster in the coming years. If we are to achieve more, though, it will have some significant implications for our university and its current modes of operating. Our discussions with many of you and our experiences at conferences and with colleagues from other universities have made us realize a number of things. First, in terms of academics, sustainability calls upon us to learn across disciplines, and we will need to continue to promote such opportunities in our teaching and our research. We will also need to see our campus and neighboring communities as partners for engaged learning around built environments, alternative transportation, gardening, energy use and alternative energy, among many other topics. Second, as our plan is implemented and reevaluated in the coming years, we need to keep in mind that a more holistic approach to sustainability planning and funding will be necessary. This will involve moving beyond the rubric of the climate commitment and its assessment tools, for example, to something like an ecological footprint assessment, now in use at some universities. Such an assessment would take into account other environmental factors, such as water usage and the amount of landfill space used, in addition to greenhouse gas emissions. A focus on greenhouse gas emissions, or our carbon footprint, while a fruitful way to get us started on this journey is too narrow for the complex processes and decisions that our institution and society undergo. Our responsible stewardship calls for a broader vision and broader work. Third, and perhaps most importantly, planning and budgeting will need to become a long-range undertaking that allows us to include resource conservation, educational benefits, building life cycles, and other measures alongside the more typical short-range financial ones. The combination of long-term planning and thinking and an ecological footprint assessment will mean that we take the future of our planet and our students' grandchildren as seriously as we take our educational quality, our enrollment numbers, and our endowment. You've just heard a lot of information and if it leaves you a bit breathless, that's probably understandable. Many of these initiatives are new for us. And if you wish to review these accomplishments, we will make this day's presentation available on our website. And after William McDonough's presentation, there will be time for questions. William McDonough is an internationally recognized designer and one of the primary proponents and shapers of what he and his partner call the next industrial revolution. Time magazine recognized him in 1999 as a hero for the planet, stating that his utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that in demonstrable and practical ways is changing the design of the world. Mr. McDonough's leadership in, in sustainable de development is recognized wi widely, both in the United States and internationally. Time Magazine again recognized Mr. McDonough and Michael Brangart as heroes for the environment in October 2007. In 1996, Mr. McDonough received the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development, the nation's highest environmental honor. Mr. McDonough is the founding principal of William McDonough and Partners, an internationally recognized design firm practicing ecologically, socially, and environmentally intelligent architecture and planning in the United States and abroad. He is also principal for MBDC, 
a product and system development firm assisting prominent clients, com client companies in designing profitable and environmentally intelligent solutions. Mr. McDonough is consulting professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. He is on the advisory board of the University of Cambridge Program for Sustainability Leadership. He has written and lectured extensively on his design philosophy and practice. He was commissioned in 1991 to write the Hanover Principles, Design for Sustainability, as guideline for the city of Hanover's Expo 2000. Mr. McDonough and Michael Brangart co-authored Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, published in 2002 by North Point Press. Please join me in welcoming Mr. William McDonough. When I hear people say we need to do cradle to cradle and we need to think about natural capital, there was a professor who there. Is that, is that professor here? Entrepreneurialism? Yes, there you are. Hello. Thank you for doing that. But I would like to talk about that a little bit. And it might be worth engaging in, in questions afterwards on this because what I'm finding in the environmental movement and the business movement taking up sustainability is actually getting a slightly off track. And that slightly off track has to do with people. It has to do with us. And it has to do with a kind of fierce need for us to be careful about the words we use and the strategies we adopt. And so I'd like to put out today an idea with Cradle to Cradle that is actually around the concept of being more good, not less bad. And it's a value statement because being less bad sounds to a lot of people like a double negative, which it is, but this isn't math. In math, a double negative is a positive. In design, a double negative is less bad is bad. <laughs> it's just less so. So you're still bad. So how do we get past bad? And what worries me really deeply, when I hear somebody say natural capitalism, Is nature capital? Is a butterfly money? Is nature there for our use? Or are we there to be part of nature? What if we were there to support nature as part of it rather than see it through the lenses of capital that we use? What if we looked at the other way? And what you find is people who talk about natural capital they go, well, you know, we got to do better. We have to use our resources more efficiently because they're limited. I'm sorry. That's not okay. And the reason it's not okay is what it's meaning to people. There's irony in it. Sustainability as a word we very rarely use ourselves because. If I said to you, what's your relationship to your spouse? And you said, sustainable. <laughs> I mean, are we having fun yet? You know, we're, we're supposed to be fecund people. We're supposed to be having a good time. Sustainable? What is this, maintenance? And what, what do these eco-evangelists get up and tell us? Like, oh, my goal is zero. Well, that's nice. If you're bad and your goal is zero, fine. And if you say, oh, carbon releases are bad, well, then shoot yourself because you're going to be breathing in and out your whole life. So you might as well give it up now. Right? <laughs> carbon is just a material. The problem is we have the bad design. We, have, we don't have an energy problem at all. We have plenty of energy. We have coal, we have oil, we have gas, we have probably fracking gas around here somewhere. That's not the issue. It's a material problem we have. It's carbon 
in the wrong place. There's nothing wrong with carbon. It doesn't know if it's a good or a bad. It just belongs in soil. That's all. It does not belong in the atmosphere. 43% of the anthropogenic carbon produced since 1850 by humans is now in the oceans, causing carbonic acid. Our, our acidity levels in the oceans, historically at 8.8 .8 to 8.2 pH, depending on where you are, is now at 8.06. And, and it's expected, even at 450 parts per billion in the carbon in the atmosphere, that it will get to 7.9 pH by end of century, which for you chemists is what? It's carbonic acid. That's very interesting. What does carbonic acid do to a coral reef? It dissolves it. Mollusks won't be able to form shells. We are dropping out the bottom of the food chain. So if our design, if our plan is to terrifyingly toxify the atmosphere with carbon, which belongs in soil, or terrifyingly drop out the bottom of the food chain with carbon, which belongs in soil, then fill the Pacific Ocean with plastics, 43%. I mean, there's 46 times more plastic than plankton in the Pacific gyres. Right? If this is our plan, we're doing great. If this is not our plan, who's got the plan? And it's not natural capital. Sorry, it's not. Because cradle to cradle doesn't say use nature. That's what you said on the video. I, it, it got me because you said use natural materials and no more synthetic chemicals. I'm sorry, that's not cradle to cradle at all. And you can't go natural, folks. We're past that point. We dominate this planet. 99% of the large mammals are under human management. And going natural, some of the most carcinogenic things in the world are natural. That's what it is. We're not going back to nature. Anybody here wearing a pair of blue jeans? All right. If you want to go back to nature, right, why don't we get you some organic cotton blue jeans, right, etc. And when we get to the blue, let's use natural. Natural indigo is a mutagen. Right? It will change your genetic structure. God apparently did not intend for us to be blue. Okay. <laughs> So, if I gave you a naturally dyed pair of blue jeans, you would change your genes while you change your genes. <laughs> okay. Is that what we want? Go natural? I don't think so. And if we grew enough indigo to satisfy the human desire for blue, we wouldn't be able to grow food. We'd be growing indigo everywhere. Whereas on the other hand, BASF, a very large chemical company, has synthesized an exquisite blue. Safe, healthy, cost effective, doesn't take up land, et cetera, et cetera. And we can have blue. It's a synthetic chemical. It's important for us to celebrate our creativity. But chemicals aren't bad. Chemicals don't know if they're bad or good. It's like a hammer. A, a tool ha only has its value based on the intention to which it's put. So a hammer's not a good or a bad. If I hit you in the face with it, it's bad. If I build a house for you with it, it's a good. Efficiency being less bad. Is it a good? Is efficiency a good? Depends on what you're doing, doesn't it? Right? What if you're a Nazi? An efficient Nazi is worse than an inefficient Nazi. Efficiency doesn't know if it's a good or a bad. These are values we're talking about, not numbers. This is not about metrics. It's not about capital. It's about values. It's a different level. That's why I'm so excited to be at this institution. This institution, I know, I've been here before. I'm very pleased to say. And what we talk about here are values. What you're doing with your university is having an open dialogue around the values. Let's talk today about design as a signal of human intention, because that's what represents your values. If you intend to destroy the planet, your values are suspect. And if you destroy the planet, 
and you just do it a little more slowly, guess what? Your intentions are still in question. So, we talk about very high level things at this institution. So what are they? Well, Leibniz had this amazing sentence. And whole books have been written about this. If it is possible, therefore it exists. I'm a designer. That's the world I live in. Okay? I speak of the future in the present tense. It's like that. And when somebody says, you can't do that, it just gets me going. Right? That's my job. So if it is possible, therefore it exists. We did the world's largest green roof on an auto plant, 10 and a half acres. We started, they said, you can't do that. I said, oh, really? Well, if you think you can't, you probably can't. If you think you can, you might be able to. Let's give it a shot. We might learn something. Who knows? And our attitude is if we can make it real, we make it exist. Because for 99.999% of this, of this species, they work on the opposite. If it exists, therefore, it is possible. So my job is to be eccentric, sorry, and to make things that you might think are impossible exist so that you can look at them and say it is possible, right? like that. And it's not about, oh, we're going natural. No, we're not going natural. We will do things in nature critical that we support the natural world, no question about it. But we're not here to rape it efficiently. We're here to support it effectively. Peter Drucker said, it's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. But it's the executive's job to do the right thing. And there's the value. Right? If we can do the right thing by nature, that's our relationship, not manage our natural capital efficiently. See the difference? OK. So let's go. This is about something lived and something dreamed in my case. I live this and I dream this. And I think that's what all of us have to do now, is celebrate it. Not the limits of the world, but the abundance of the world. See, I walk outside and I see the sun shining, and I go, oh, look at the abundance of nuclear power. Isn't it beautiful? Thermonuclear reactor. It's 93 million miles away, it's eight minutes, and it's wireless. And there's so much more that we need. Let's get on with it. People ask me what I think of clean nuclear power. I love clean nuclear power. 93 million miles away, it's perfect. <laughs> and we're talking about fusion. We got it already. Let's get on with it. Anyway, we can dream about these things. So when I went to Dartmouth, as an undergraduate, I went into uh, a physics class, and I was an art student. And uh, my physics professor said, what are you doing here? You're an art student. He said, well, I grew up in Japan. And so I have two questions of physics. One is, and they're related, one is, why did Hiroshima and Nagasaki disappear? And the other is, why was Einstein afraid? And, and my professor, terrific, goes, oh, OK. You want to know the special theory of relativity. Fine. Handed me this huge book, really thin pages, lots of formulas. I said, here, go read this, figure it out. So I take it back to my dorm room. And I'm an art student. And I'm looking through this thing going, no, I can't do this. And I left it open on my knee, equals mc squared. I stared at it for a long time. I lit a fire. We had a little dorm room with a fire. It was nice. And I lit, it was nice. We had a little triplex, a little living room. And I, I lit the fire, and I stared at it, and I stared at it. I kept looking at E equals MC squared. All of a sudden, I was looking at the fire, and I thought, oh, this is what we studied today, entropy. Well, let's see. If entropy is the dispersion of this log through energy transfer, et cetera, and these minerals and these the smoke and these particulates and all the stuff that is log disappears into chaos. That's kind of like what's happening in the planet. Everything's moving toward chaos. 
And the whole point is you can't re-aggregate. Well, if that's the case, we're in trouble. So I said, you know, I come from the Far East. There must be something that's the opposite. What's the yin-yang here? Well, there must be, therefore, something that's known as negative entropy. And I couldn't find it anywhere. Negative entropy is for Google. You know, you can, there's no, nothing in the index, negative entropy. You know, it's like, so I thought about what would negative entropy be? Negative entropy, if I thought about it, would be the log. Right? It's the aggregation of a dispersed form of energy, sun, combined with the minerals and the water, and something happens called log, which then gets entropically disengaged in my fireplace. So negative entropy must be the tree. So then I thought, well, I want to be an architect. What if I could design buildings like that? What if we could design things that instead of destroying the natural world, or efficiently using it as capital. What if I created capital? Human, valuable capital, using the laws of nature, rather than abusing its products. What if I could aggregate revenue, rather than manage to profits? What if I could have triple top line thinking, instead of triple bottom line thinking for, su for sustainability. I hate it when I hear triple bottom line. Everything becomes something for humans to use and to measure what's left over. Isn't it the job of an executive to produce revenue? What if I could produce revenue, natural revenue? What if I could produce economic revenue? What if I could produce social revenue? What if the world got better? And then it's the manager's job to leave something behind for profit. But unless the executive brings in the revenue, there's nothing to manage to profit. What if we could do better? What if we did good instead of bad and less bad? What would that look like? So I decided at that moment, I want to design a building like a tree. And everybody said, that's impossible. Now, why is that impossible? This is where I grew up in Tokyo. I used to hear the ox carts in the middle of the night come pick up our sewage to take it to the farmers. And my mother would call, talk at the, you know, the, the farmers were coming to collect the night soil in their honey wagons. And you're three years old, and poop stories are the best things you've ever heard. You know? <laughs> I just thought this was great. Our poop becomes food. You know? Waste equals food. And my summers were in the Hood Canal of Washington State, Puget Sound, a world of abundance and giant trees. And my grandparents were really careful with everything. And, traded compost for flowers with neighbors and stuff like that. And I thought, this is great. You know, everybody's very careful and, and things are nice. And, and then we moved to Hong Kong and I lived with six million people on 42 square miles. The refugees coming in from communist China and our people would be lost on hillsides during the monsoons. We'd have cholera, typhoid, diphtheria, you name it, everything. And that was our world. And beggars used to use dying babies for sympathy and it, they were dying of hunger. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. And it was like living in the future. What happens when you're constrained at that level of resource? We had four hours of water every fourth day. That was it. You had to put a bucket under every tap just to have enough to boil, to drink, to keep alive. That was ordinary life. Ordinary life. And the relationship of people to the land was completely different. This land has been farmed for 5,000 years. How do you farm the same piece of dirt for 5,000 years if you don't understand nutrient flow? In ancient China, it was impolite to take somebody's nutrition after a meal. At, when you left a meal in China, in the countryside, they closed the door and there was a clay pot outside the door and you were meant to leave a deposit because otherwise you were taking their nutrition. It's that tight. Now, 5,000 years, hmm. how smart are humans? What if we could design a building like a tree? But how smart are we really as designers? I mean, it, it did take us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> well, we're really not that smart. So what would it mean to understand a world of fecundity and growth? And when I got to Connecticut, my dad became the president of Seagram in New York, their overseas wines and spirits business. And 
We lived, moved to Westport, Connecticut, and I walked into the gym after my first day in class, and the boys all left the showers running on hot and left. They just left the water running hot. And I went into crisis. And I haven't come out. I just don't get it. So I asked myself, what does it mean to be an indigenous person? I grew up, in, I went to 19 schools in four languages before college. What, what does it mean to be an indigenous person? That was really curiosity for me. How many of you consider yourselves indigenous? Huh. Just one. Two? Three. Yeah. Good. Okay. What does it mean to be indigenous? At the Hanford Nuclear Plant, where we store our plutonium for our bombs and missiles, they had a symposium. They brought together senior scientists and semiologists, sign designers, to design a sign where we've stored our plutonium so that even an extraterrestrial landing here 5,000 years from now wouldn't dare to dig. Isn't that an amazing design assignment, right? The semiology of extreme danger. Okay, what would it look like? Anyway, the Yakima were there, found out what the scientists were doing, and started laughing. I said, you know, you really don't need to worry about this. I said, what? He said, yeah, we'll tell them where it is. That's an indigenous person. They're not leaving. See the difference? They're going to be here 5,000 years from now telling the stories. That's an indigenous person. We're all indigenous people to that. We're not leaving. So the minute you think of yourself as indigenous to the planet, you can start imagine, imagining we're going to tell the stories for 5,000 years. What are our stories? Are they be less bad stories? A carpet manufacturer gets up, calls himself an eco-evangelist. And what does he do? He takes our idea that carpets should be in closed loops. But what does he sell? PVC. He sells cancer. So is that the story? We're going to reuse cancer and keep spreading around on people's floors and call yourself an eco-evangelist? Is that it? Where's the value there? His goal is zero. I hope so. I hope that company goes away because I don't want cancer spread everywhere. Is that a great goal? How about 100% good? Let's do that. Not zero bad. So all these efficiency things I'm hearing about is wonderful. They're very important, and I'll explain why. But there's a wrinkle we could add here that's values-based. It's not metrics. Values. Very different. You don't want to measure how you're less impactful on the environment while you're giving kids cancer. Okay? I don't care about your metric. Your value's wrong. You're doing the wrong thing. So after Dartmouth, I went to live with a Bedouin in, in the Holy Land. And uh, their tents were amazing. They do 16 things. And they're one material, goat's hair. And they're made by a factory that follows you around and eats everything you can't. And they give you flesh and butter and cheese and wool. And all that. Entertainment, even. They're fun. And, and you get this tent, and it can go back to nature. You also get Bedouin tents. Oops, sorry. I forgot to set up my pointer. Uh, you also get Bedouin tents that um, combined with, uh, with mud huts, you know, allow for thermal mass, what we call capacity insulation, where we have shade here, and we have transparency. And these are the elements of architecture. And these architectures all go back to the soil safely. They all return to the earth. It's a sacred relationship. And then I go to Yale and I study architect, modern architecture. And this is um, Mies van der Rohe, 1930. And this is Berlin. And here's six-story Berlin. How many people find this a beautiful thing? Okay. So I looked at this and went, wow. Look, at, imagine that. What a concept. But as it... As I looked at it, uh, things started to dawn on me. Where's South? Sorry, that's glass. Right? This is an oven. Germany, 30s. 
What else? The windows don't open. This has to evolve at the same time as cheap fossil fuel. Right? Otherwise, the, those Bedouin could never live here. You have to open the windows. You have to shade yourself. You have to store the night coolness for the day. I mean, what are you going to do? This is all has to be driven by boilers. So think about it. Emerson went to Europe after his wife died in 1831. He goes over on a sailboat and returns in a steamship. Think about that. He goes over in a solar-powered, recyclable vehicle operated by ancient craftspeople practicing their arts in the open air and returns in a steel rust bucket putting oil on the water, smoke into the sky, operated by people working in the darkness shoveling fossil fuels in the mouths of boilers. What is our design? What is our intention? This is steamship. And the materials that are in the furniture and the carpets appear to have never been designed for indoor use. We do gas chromatography. We watch what off gas is from this stuff. I'm telling you, that's an oven and a gas chamber, right? Is that the plan? Is that the intention? There are a lot of unintended consequences around efficiency. Mies van der Rohe famously said, less is more. And I guess for eco-evangelists who make PVC, less is more until you have nothing. Is that our plan? To have nothing? This is a building by Le Corbusier, famously designed for the climate in Marseille. But what's the style known as? Anybody know what this is? Any architects here? What is it? Thank you. Brutalism. Now, where'd we get that? Brutalism. We call it that, proudly. Brutalism. We're brutal to each other. Ooh. Think about it. What's our intention? Brutality? This, I think, was the first celebration of modern design. The Crystal Palace, Sir Joseph Paxton. At the exact same time, he was building this gossamer building, prefabricated out of part, metal parts built in nine months from the day it was conceived. He was building Lismore Castle for the Duke of Devonshire with 16-foot thick stone walls. This is the cusp of the first Industrial Revolution. Less is more. Lightness, transparency, solar energy. This is a solar heated building, the first giant solar heated building. This is what cathedrals were about. Light, connecting to the heavens. But there's our efficiency again. Here's Buckminster Fuller, an incredibly efficient designer, focused on tensegrity, which is everything in tension is a cable, everything in compression is a strut. Right? The least amount of material to do the maximum job. But he proposes that we air condition Midtown. So is, trans is transparency a gift? Is it connecting us to the outdoors? Or are we just trying to protect ourselves from the smoke we created by other things that are wrongly designed? See where I'm going? This could, where does this end? Do we all end up, the whole planet ends up in a bubble? What is the sign of extreme danger? Can you guess which way the wind blows in this, in Hyderabad? All right. So, as a student, I'm showing this for you know, the second time in public. This is the house I built while I was at Yale. It's the first solar heated house in Ireland, which will give you a sense of my ambition because there's no sun in Ireland. But <laughs> the collectors are, are vertical because they catch the winter sun, which is very low, in 55 degrees north latitude. Two of them are windows. Uh, I worked with NASA and Norman Foster, who donated the uh, aluminum uh, um, uh, mullions, and uh, NASA donated the copper. And the thing works very simply. The air heats up, and there's a, a duct up here, and the damper opens if sitting in grease. It just a gravity damper, and if the air is rising, it comes out and goes inside the house. And if the air is dropping at night where it's cold, uh, the gravity damper down here shuts, and that's it. So open if the air is moving, in with the good, out with the bad. It's just simple, silent. So anyway, the, the tradition in Ireland, um, when you have a, oh, sorry, when you have a house, here we put a, you know, evergreen bough on the top of the structure or something. Um, there you get a poet, and you write a poem for the house. And you give the poem to the people who are going to live there. So I hired a poet. 
And he came, and he stood on this landing, and um, in the silence, this is due west, the sun, the building's a clock. You can tell what time it is just by looking at the shadows. Little lines here and there that tell you what time it is. It's kind of fun, different days of the year. And um, anyway, he stood there for about half an hour in this silent, warm place. And he goes, like a warrior, his, you know, his veins started to pulse. He looked like he was getting ready to go to war. You know? And he goes, this is a fierce commotion. That was my poem. So ever since then, I realized my job is on fierce commotion in silence, using nature as, not as a tool, but as where I am and what I'm part of. Nature is not here for me, we're here together. So we got little gifts as we wander around. That was my last sight of the house as I was walking away. That's something, just popped right out. This is that Irish call this fairy. The way they describe the world of fairy is everything's exactly the same as this world. It's just a little bit better. So I went to New York to apprentice, and I ended up doing the master plan for Times Square for the mayor. And then I decided that's it. <laughs> Enough training. And so I didn't have any work, so I went up to Vermont, and I renovated four hydroelectric plants and made a megawatt of electricity, renovating old turbines. and. Got involved in the windmill business. In 1980, we started building wind, wind turbines. This is 30 years ago, folks. Okay. And then I, in 1984, I came back to New York, started my office, and then we designed the national headquarters for Environmental Defense Fund. And it was the first so-called green office in America. We started asking all these suppliers what's in their carpets, what's in the glues, what's in the paint, what's the quality of light, is there mercury in here, where'd the wood come from, et cetera. And everybody said, oh, it's proprietary, it's legal, go away. We're still at it. Our client base right now, our clients' annual revenues are $1.5 trillion. We're still at this. Okay? We just never gave up. We just started asking questions. We haven't stopped. The second green office was 1989. So for five years, we were alone. Little squeaks in the wilderness. Okay? And then in 1989, I got my chance. I won a competition in Frankfurt, Germany designed a daycare center. And I said, what if a building could be like a tree? And the engineer said, what are you talking about? I said, no, what if we designed a daycare center operated with children? He said, you can't have children operating a daycare center. They're little children. I said, why not? What, are your children brain dead? No. Kids know what to do. They know about poop and wheels when they're three. You know, they know what to do. And they said, you can't do this. So I said, well, let's try it. So we designed a building that had the big south-facing rooms for the kids and administration here and so on. And then we designed a roof where it has two shutters over on this side and, and a big crank. And so in the winter, they let the sun in to warm the room with the shutters over on the north side. In the summer, they put the shutters on the south side and have the cool north light. And at night, they put the building to bed, splitting the shutters. And having an insulated envelope. It uses geothermal, so like roots. The roof um, is gardens, so the kids garden. So these are the skylights. So they have food, they have shelter, they have heating and cooling, light. They have a building like a tree. A building would generate more energy than it needs to operate. Fecundity, children, sustainability, joy. Right? We like kids. See, the problem I want to get to here that's critical is if we look at the history of human activity and the dawn of the sustainable development strategy, which we were obviously engaged with too, is that we had socialism in 92 and we had capitalism. Okay. These things are not good for the environment. A pure capitalist will cut down the trees and forget the fish. Right. A Pure socialists will yield, as we now see, the former USSR is 16% uninhabitable. It's called ecocide. Okay, so neither of those extremes are good for the environment. Thanks. And what we're looking at is isms. They're dangerous. So what with sustainable development coming on, we get ecologism. That would be just as dangerous, where we worry about 
our resources more than our people. So when we hear big environmentalists talk about the carbon problem, then they say, oh, by the way, we have a big population problem. We've got to reduce our populations. If a child in India is walked up to and somebody says, you're a population problem, human rights cease to exist. Just like that. We have to design for 9 billion people. We have to celebrate every child that's born. We have to celebrate the optimism and the hope and the creativity. So we said, let the children operate. And the engineers said, no way. And then we got the teachers in. And the teachers looked at the engineers and they said, look, you know what we spend our entire day doing? Trying to find things for the kids to do. <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be great if they came in in the morning and we go, what's the weather going to be like today? Let's open up the shutters or let's close them or who cares? You know, put the building in bed at night. What difference does it make? Let the children run the building. Then in 89, we won another competition for a tower in Warsaw, but we asked the developer to plant 10 square miles of trees to offset the carbon effects of building this building. And it ended up on the Wall Street Journal on the front page with, we'll pull and plant an architect, you know, plant a, a forest to suit an architect who loves clean air. And now famously green architects were commenting back then on me saying I was a nutcase. So. But, and even the New Yorker made a cartoon. All these business executives come in. It's great. You tell them how much pollution your company is responsible for, and he tells you how many trees you have to plant to atone for it. This is, I guess, buying indulgences or something like that. <laughs> this is 20 years ago. So then I met Michael, a chemist, and we started to look at what it meant to design for sustainability with celebration and joy, and what it meant to become indigenous people. And where are we indigenous? Well, how about this? You know, what's here? What picture? You know, that's gravity right there. This, you know, I'm an architect. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. So what else is there for us to think about on this planet? And we look around. We have all the science now. We can see things going on in the oceans. And let's use that. So the cradle to cradle is a plastic book. And why? It's a technical nutrient. It's synthetic chemicals designed for infinite human benefit. That's what it is. So it's not using nature as a tool, because what we're saying in this is there's another metabolism, which is a world of industrial product synthesized, but it should be designed to be safe. Why are we worried about synthetics? Because we, we're scared that they're not safe, and you should be scared. You get interface carpet, put it on your floor, you get cancer. Hey, I would be scared about that too. <laughs> Fair enough, right? And so, yeah, was natural better? I don't, I don't think so. And the reason is, when, the reason we did it in polymer was to make a point. Margaret Atwood, when told that the New York Times Sunday Magazine took five square miles of clear cut in British Columbia, said, oh, I see. We write our weekly history on the skin of fish with the blood of bears. Why would I use something as exquisite as a tree and a forest making oxygen, et cetera, when I could use this infinitely and safely? And we're awash in plastic, as we see in the ocean. We could make all these things as synthetic materials that are for our benefit. So let's design what we want, optimized, and not just be more efficient with what we don't want, because if we reduce our carbon, so what? We're still carbon. Let's go for something much greater than that. Let's go for effectiveness, not efficiency. Let's do the right thing. A cherry tree, we don't look at it in the spring and say, how many blossoms does it take? You know, how inefficient can you be? You know, we don't listen to Mozart and think, oh, how many notes does it take? You know, he could have hit the piano with a two by four. Got them all at once. It would have been very efficient. <laughs> but would we love it? You know, would we love it? Is this a celebration of creative abundance? Absolutely not. Sorry for this mess. What we're looking at is biological metabolisms were identified by Crick and Watson with DNA. And that's been the whole world. But 5,000 years ago, uh, 5,000 years uh, before the invention of wheels on luggage, um, we'd created a technical metabolism. This is where synthetics and this is a world of materials like TVs and cars, and carpets that could go back to themselves forever. But if they get into the biosphere, like PVC carpet, in your biosphere, right, you get cancer. So if that gets over there, it's a problem. It's called pollution. Right? So we decided, well, let's, what if our technosphere could be designed to be coherent? And we design all these materials to circulate back into the technosphere. Computers become computers. They never see the biosphere. Lead is no longer a toxin. It's a technical nutrient. I need it to make solder. Just don't release it in the biosphere. It becomes a neurotoxin. So I'll just finish up here. Buildings, 
that make more energy than they need to operate. This is Oberlin College, it's 10 years old. We started in 1992, a building like a tree. We had a, a celebration there a couple weeks ago, and people said, how come it's not lead rated, but so good? And we said, we did this building before US Green Building Council existed. Hello? And a platinum building, they're trying to reduce carbon by 20%. This thing makes 113% more energy than it needs to operate and purifies its own water. What would you call that in a lead score? I don't know. Lead on steroids? Uh, <laughs> something. I know it's different. It's alive. It's a building, that's an organism. It's a, it's a living thing. We study the materials down to the parts per billion, parts per million. We do science. And we assess products based on no more cancer. Goodbye, PVC carpet. Out. Done. It's non-negotiable. This is negligence. If we know that's carcinogenic and we pr keep selling it and calling it natural capital, we're, si we're in trouble. It's not OK. It's negligent. It's, it's criminal. All these have to go. No more birth defects. No all this designed in there. It's wrong at this point. Environmental health. We want to make sure stuff is safe in water for vertebrates and vertebrates and plants. We want to know if it bioaccumulates. Mother's milk in Germany has 2,500 chemicals in it. 2,500 chemicals in mother's milk. It would be illegal to sell on a store shelf. Is that our intention? Is that what we're doing? No more of this. And we want to know where things come from, where they go, and then we got to optimize. So that's what we do. Now we take all the nasties, get rid of them, and make things healthy. That's what we do. So we design things that are safe materials that get reutilized. Energy comes from renewable sources. Water is clean enough to drink, and we practice social responsibility. Anybody got a problem with this? So we developed a certification system. Here's a fabric that's been chosen for the Airbus 380. Safest fabric in the world. It's clean enough to eat. Good news for frequent flyers, if you're 40,000 feet with an extreme fiber deficiency, you can eat your chair. <laughs> the water coming out of the mill is now clean enough to drink, cleaner than Swiss drinking water. Why wouldn't I do that? Why should our textile mills destroy all the rivers in China? Bad chemistry. They have 250 undefined chemicals. We can do it with 38 fully defined, and the water is drinkable. Why wouldn't we do that? Carpets. This is for Warren Buffett, for Shaw. They reformulated the carpet, got rid of the PVC. And they make the top out of Nylon 6, bottom of polyolefin, infinitely reusable. 1.4 billion pounds of carpet waste in America every year. If we do this, it's infinitely reusable, and we maintain our carpet industry, which is the last textile industry in this country. And these are technical nutrients. They're synthetic materials. They're infinitely reusable, healthy, and safe. Why not? Furniture companies have taken this up. We designed for disassembly. Postal service, 28 billion. Products certified, cradle to cradle. The child had put their mouth on that red. We don't know what would have happened. Well, we do, but we're not going to talk about it. Now they get nutrition. <laughs> uh, we're looking at how to solve the bottle, the bottle, the water bottle, and how to design it. We do buildings like trees and meadows. This is 1993, the Gaps headquarters, now YouTube. An ancient meadow of grasses, ancient grasses. Herman Miller, restoring the native landscape. People working in full of daylight and fresh air, 50% less energy, $49 a square foot built in nine months. Full of daylight, fresh air, views of the outdoors. 250 people moved from a dark factory to this factory. They started making $100 million more furniture. Same people. Worth $40 million a year to Herman Miller. Bottom line, $100 million top. Paid for the building in four months. Oberlin, making more energy than it needs to operate. A biological nutrient building for Bernheim Forest in Louisville. A building made from the forest to go back to the forest eventually in a thousand years. It's made of carbohydrate, silicon, steel. A building of the forest itself. And then we got this assignment, take the rouge on. This, the joke in Dearborn is the color photograph, obviously. Um, anyway, we were purifying the soils with plants instead of chemicals, phytoremediation. We built the world's largest green roof. Ten and a half acres. We saved Ford $35 million capex over conventional engineering. When I presented the board for approval, I simply said, we designed a building and it's for the birds. And that's true. But you're fiduciaries in a car company, so let me say in car speak what we're offering you. We're saving you $35 million capex day one with the Ford Taurus at a 4% margin coming out of Chicago. 
This is the equivalent of an order for $900 million worth of cars. Do you want it or not? Approved. Next. There it is. Look at the kill deer. The birds started landing within five days of nesting. Now, why should a roof be asphalt? You see, in our lexicon, asphalt is two words. <laughs> so what if we had buildings that were photosynthetic? Here's a museum. Here's an airport. This is the waste handling system for San Francisco. This is distribution centers for logistics and reverse logistics for Walmart, 10 million square feet in the UK. Brad Pitt and I are friends, and we started a project to help the poor in the Lower Ninth Ward with a levee broke with that barge. And, um, and so we've, uh, we're building 150 houses. This is our fundraising exercise. Um, these are our clients. And now people are living with a $400 mortgage and a $20 energy bill. Hospice care workers, single mothers, can send their kids to karate lessons and dance lessons. And this one woman who lives here came up to me and she said, you know, my daughter wanted to be a dancer. And now she can I can afford her dance lessons. But she said, the other thing you need to know is that for three years, you know, my daughter has asthma. And you know what it's like? when you wake up every morning and your child is going <gasps> You said, ever since we moved to our new house, her asthma has gone away. Now she can be a dancer. Cradle, cradle. We aren't efficiently producing the wrong carpets. We're not efficiently producing formaldehyde-laden cabinets. We're worrying about the people and their health not our efficiency of the use of abstract capital. We're talking about what does it mean to be part of nature. This is a space station we designed for NASA. It's in California. It just got declared uh, the most innovative building in America. It's got the presidential award from the General Service Administration. It makes, it's going to make 130% of the energy it needs, purifies its own water, et cetera. I mean, it's not like LEED because there's too many things it's doing. Anyway, what we're talking about is continuous improvement. So instead of just saying I'll be less bad and putting it on the top of the line, we say, good, it's below the line. It's negative. So your less bad is a good trajectory. It's better. Do it. Save the energy. Absolutely. Don't not be efficient. Just remember, you're supposed to be doing what's on the top, being more good. Herman Miller and Steelcase are now 100% renewably powered. They didn't reduce their carbon footprint. They became a positive contributor of solar energy to the planet. Same with NASA. This is a lead platinum building. That's how much energy it uses. That's carbon, that much. We only use this much, then we put PVs on the roof, then we put them in the parking lot, now we give back to society. Look at the water use in sewage. We went to the rocket scientists and said, hey, all those poop and pee in the water, guys. What are you supposed to do about that? And they go, oh, we know how to do that. We do that in space every day. So that's your job, right? Bingo. This is a solar-powered building for the Northern Hemisphere. China, we're working with China on the future of cities. This is a statement by the president of China. Resolutely stopping all practices that are detrimental to nature. A circular economy, a virtuous cycle. That is how you translate cradle to cradle into Chinese. And so when the premier said, we're going to lose all our farms because the cities are destroying the farmland. We're going to lose 20% of our farmland by 2020. I sent him this picture. I said, why are these mutually exclusive things? Why do human footprints have to be so negative? You talk about footprint analysis, right? The problem is everybody's measuring their footprints like negative footprint. What is our negative footprint? I would propose Xavier should change that. You should become the first institution to measure your positive footprint. See, at the Rouge in Detroit, if we had come and said reduce your negative footprint, we would have made more efficient use of chemicals treating the water. We, we left behind a positive footprint. We left behind a wetland when you, we saw what was before. Anyway, this is the final slide, sorry. This is a building we're doing in Barcelona. The floor plans are triangles like butterflies, so the floor plans are now butterfly wings in tile. The ancient butterflies of Barcelona. And we're going to hatch every week these ancient butterflies, and the children will be invited. And they can come and see as we release thousands of ancient butterflies back into the environment. Why couldn't a building restore biodiversity? How about a positive footprint? Why don't we start to measure things in butterflies? Why not? Natural capital, butterflies, currency, what fun. 
So California is adopting Cradle to Cradle. We announced our gift of Cradle to Cradle to the public domain on May 20th. We turned it over to a not-for-profit. And as we look at the future and we think of our cities and our people, we have to realize we are where nature and artifice meet. We are biological characters within the history of biology. That's where we connect to nature. And that the question becomes, can our artifice be an artifact of the natural world that we get to celebrate and live in, something we live and something we dream? Design is the first signal of human intention. What is our intention as a species? We dominate the planet now. We need to design for nine billion, not two billion. Thank you. I, I couldn't help but think uh, that this is really quite wonderful in a measure of how special the event was, uh, because it's seldom that you get mixes of faculty, staff, and students uh, to come to any one thing in particular. Uh, when you have that mix, it seems to me you found something very, very special. Um, and so um, uh, that, that's something that I'm very uh, grateful for. I need to begin with a kind of a disclaimer. Uh, this is always a risky place to begin by saying, uh, uh, kind of you're sorry about something. What I'm sorry for is that I wrote this talk, or I made all these notes, half of which I won't even use now, uh, before I heard the last speaker. <laughs> and so I was trying to imagine, uh, the farther he got into his talk, what this talk might be now, if I, and I don't know. Um, so, uh, but that's probably a good thing, actually. Uh, so uh, at any rate, I, f I feel as if my head's been kind of like, taken apart and it hasn't gotten back together yet. Um, I also uh, want to begin uh, simply by saying thanks, of course, to Kathleen and Dave and to the other members of the Sustainability Committee uh, whose hard work behind the scenes, uh, very hard work uh, behind the scenes, uh, has really helped us get uh, to where we are now. Uh, the creation a, a year ago of that greenhouse gas inventory, which became the, uh, the plan, uh, which was uh, filed just to um, about 10 days ago or so, something like that, uh, would not have happened absent their um, incredible efforts and all of the kinds of activities that, that they listed uh, in the course of the talk and on the video, um, that all of that, of course, has been mightily catalyzed by everything that they've done. So thank you very much for um, all the work that you've done. One of the truths, though, is that the Sustainability Committee in its present term is not sustainable, you know, and so we need to kind of figure out a way to keep that going. I'll, I'll speak a bit about that in a, in a moment. Uh, the way that I look at today uh, is through the lens of Jesuit spirituality, curiously, and it goes like this, that one of the elements of Jesuit spirituality is something called the examine. It's a way of training uh, your heart and your uh, mind to look over the course of the most recent period of time, whatever that is, the, the morning, the day, um, the last week, whatever that might be, and to ask yourself the question, ultimately, in Ignatian terms, you know, when did you experience the presence of God, and how did you respond to it, how positively, how, how negatively, how might you have responded better, and then, by way of resolution, what will you do going forward? There's uh, a way in which, it seems to me, for us to come together uh, once a year for this kind of group reflection is to do something like Ignatius is examined, to ask ourselves what, it is it, what is it that we've been about during the course of the last period of time since the last time we did this, the looking back piece, and that was well resumed this morning, so I won't repeat that. The looking around, uh, what are we doing now? And then to ask from that, then therefore, what might we do going forward? Uh, and because, as I said, uh, we, we've taken a good amount of time on the looking uh, back and the different things that have, going on, have been going on during the course of this past year. I'll uh, uh, instead uh, focus very briefly on some things going on now, but then really talk about moving forward because I think that that's you know, kind of appropriate for me and for what I do. Uh, we are in uh, this uh, the Connaughton Learning Commons here in uh, the Kennedy um, uh, Lecture Hall. Uh, in one of our new buildings on campus that was uh, built wrong, now I see, after having heard our last <laughs> talk, <laughs> uh, uh, to aim to do less bad as opposed to do even better. Um, and, and so, uh, be that as it may, I, 
<clears throat> it's pretty good even, even for doing something less bad, it seems to me. Um, so this building is a kind of signature step forward in terms of our own uh, growing sensibility uh, with respect to sustainability and our desire to respond to it. Uh, there was some allusion made uh, in the, in the uh, video about the central utility plant across the street. It's kind of like the orphan stepchild of the Hoff Academic Quad. Uh, you know, the building that's forgot about, uh, there's this one, there's the Smith Hall across the street. Well, there's that one too, uh, and it deserves its due because even though, as Bob Sheeran often remarks, the reason it's so uh, uh, forgotten about and unsexy is because, after all, its middle name is Utility. Uh, there's, just, <laughs> there's just not much to be done with that. But it's going to become uh, an ever more powerful engine, I think, in terms of helping us uh, move in the direction uh, that, that we uh, want to go in. And so um, it was... Uh, originally built to simply handle uh, the buildings in the quad here over the course of the summer, just so you know, it's going to be connected to the uh, new residence hall, dining hall complex, and as well to the entire academic mall, which will permit us then to retire uh, the uh, less efficient uh, boilers and chillers that are in that uh, utility plant behind Logan Hall. Uh, in the course of the, uh, of the summer, we're also going to therefore be ripping up the academic mall, right? Um, it's going to uh, kind of look like uh, heck for a while. But that's to replace uh, leaking pipes and the like, which will make the transfer of energy from the central utility plant far more efficient um, and help uh, reduce our ener both our energy consumption and our energy bills. So that will be a good thing. And as you know as well, the um, residence hall complex and dining hall is well underway. We're also going to be uh, building, designing and building towards uh, silver lead equivalent standards in that and many of the strategies that will be realized in those buildings mimic exactly strategies from these buildings, whether um, it's the, uh, the reduction of heat islands or, or the uh, capturing of natural light or having motion sensors to make sure uh, that um, lights go out when things aren't occupied, um, uh, water um, flow restrictors on faucet showers and the like. Uh, there'll be a couple of new elements in, in there, um, I believe new elements, the, the uh, the toilets with the two choices of flush, kind of the low flush and the high flush, you know why. Um, and the, the last dude spoke about poop, you know, so what the heck. Um, but also the top of the, um, the dining hall complex will be a real green roof, I mean with grass and everything, you know, so that'll be uh, an exciting possibility. Uh, and then there'll also be uh, some other interesting things like the uh, the uh, refrigerant from the kitchen will be recycled to help heat water, so we'll sort of transfer the heat from the refrigerant to the water to warm it up. So there'll be some opportunities like that. I'd really encourage you to um, talk to uh, Joe Frecker or to Bob Sharon if you'd like details about um, those, those things. Uh, there's uh, several sp pages of specifications that talk about how exactly it is that we're going to be going after those uh, lead um, silver equivalent things. Um, but what I want to do is talk a little bit uh, about the future because I think that that's uh, what you're interested in and it's incumbent upon me to speak a bit about that. Um, as you know, the campus, uh, so from what I said a moment ago, was that the campus sustainability plan was filed about 10 days ago and it imagines a kind of a 20 year time horizon to carbon neutrality. Uh, although even that, as Kathleen rightly said, at the beginning of her talk really needs to be rethought. It's a nice way of getting started, but we need to think in somewhat broader terms uh, using other um, categories that are, are, relatively speaking, newer uh, to the discussion. And uh, what we, if that establishes kind of like the long distance timeline, well, what about between now and then? How is it that one moves in some kind of gradual uh, way towards that goal? recognizing that that goal itself will change as circumstances change and we begin talking in terms of other measurement tools and the like. For me, uh, as I look at it, there are sort of two key things that need to be achieved within the next several years in order for us to, in order for us to take sort of the next significant step forward. To be sure, I think that the great energy and enthusiasm that we see on campus for this will create its own kind of momentum um, and that that, that momentum will yield uh, year by year in new initiatives and undertakings, whether um, in uh, you know, dorm competitions to see which residence hall can uh, reduce its energy consumption the most or recycle the most, or whether it's new academic programs and the like. For example, the work of that faculty learning uh, uh, community on sustainability is going to be very interesting to see going forward. 
Likewise, uh, we have a model here that we've used before under several circumstances in information fluency, summer institute, a um, um, multicultural fluency institute that have uh, been mechanisms through which we've helped faculty learn how to um, uh, learn about those things, whether information fluency and its use in the classroom or um, uh, multicultural fluency. And we might uh, do s s adapt um, that um, idea and, you, and create, say, uh, sustainability uh, in, uh, uh, fluency institutes for faculty in the summer, which would help them to uh, figure out how they might uh, introduce uh, sustainability ideas into uh, their existing course material so that we can create all kinds of ways in which a the academic life of the university might go, f uh, might go forward uh, thinking more deliberately about sustainability topics and the like and certainly bringing in uh, speakers uh, from time to time as we've just uh, heard can be very uh, helpful in galvanizing university conversation. All of that I think gets to something that is terribly important behind um, helping us get to where we want to go, which is overall culture change here on the campus. And I'll speak about that more in a moment. But there are two things, I think, that are going to be very important for creating um, the sustainability of the sustainability movement here and helping it to take the next step. The first is human infrastructure. Uh, the second is um, the built environment. So let me speak a little bit about each one of them. So far, the sustainability um, committee has been uh, the beneficiary of um, completely volunteer time. We've, uh, and so Kathleen and Dave have had other jobs to do uh, while they've been doing this job. And, uh, and as, as well, uh, students and others who volunteer on it um, take time out from the things that they do in order to advance this important agenda. It's always going to be that way to some degree. Uh, you know, that, that, um, that people who are interested in sustainability will constitute a kind of a network across the university who will help move us forward. The question is, how is that led? And so it's going to be uh, very important for us in the next several years to figure out how we get funded somebody who directs this effort in a central way, who's paid to think about this full time or virtually full time, uh, perhaps a little bit of teaching and an appropriate discipline on the side, but somebody who can be uh, four square in the middle of helping to lead these efforts. Um, because that will permit them to do a great deal more than currently uh, anyone can do now. Clearly, they're going to need to be tied into academic affairs and faculty life and tied into the physical plant and so on. And so we're going to need to make sure that there's bridges built in both those directions because they're so crucial to what we need to do with this. But we need to figure out a way to get that done. That will permit us, for example, to have somebody uh, who can be uh, instrumental in helping to write grants which will uh, help raise funds that can help move the effort forward as well. So there's a variety of goods to be gained from this. We are uh, in the middle of um, a tight budget interval. I expect it to last this year and next year, and so we'll see how well we can do in terms of getting that done this year. We're very hopeful that we will. Uh, but on the other hand, we might not, so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. Um, I want to make an aside here because this is, it's an important aside, I think, in terms of looking at uh, how it is that we need to approach this uh, from um, uh, embedding it um, in, the, uh, uh, in the budget of the university. Um, last year, we had Nancy Tuckman come here from Loyola University in Chicago, and she mesmerized us uh, with um, uh, biodiesel um, Im uh, imaginings and this kind of stuff. And because I'm on the board there, I have something really even more disappointing to tell you, uh, and that's that Loyola University has just bought a uh, retreat center kind of way out in the sticks from some religious congregation that needed to make some money fast by selling off land. And uh, they're going to turn it into a, retreat, a campus retreat center, much like we kind of use Milford for, but also an ecology center, you know, so they want to use that as a, a, as a living laboratory for a lot of their uh, sciences. So it's wonderful that they're taking that step forward, and it makes me even more embarrassed that we're uh, so slow uh, to catch up to this. But I can also tell you, having been on the board at Loyola for some years, um, that they faced some very severe fiscal pressures uh, better than a decade ago. Had they not resolved them, there would be no Nancy Tuckman doing biodiesel and they would not have bought <laughs> this thing out, uh, out in the uh, boondocks. And so the, f the financial pressures that we face are far less severe um, than what they face. It's going to take us a couple of years to come out from under them. You know the story, I'm sure. I've spoken about the, these things before, uh, that within our operating budget, we have a number of structural deficits that need to get filled. For example, we don't currently fully fund the 
depreciation of all our uh, plant and building. That's the three million dollar price tag that we're going to try to catch up to in two years time. Then there's, th then there's a number of other things with technology funding, faculty salaries, and a whole variety of other things that we want to get done as quickly as possible. Uh, but at the same time, uh, to try to figure out what's the reasonable, prudent, and possible thing to do with respect to funding this initiative in the middle of it. The second issue um, is, the, uh, that is with respect to the built environment. It is very clear to me, it was even clear before the last uh, talk, that uh, for us to simply kind of train our eyes on the next big building project, which as you know will be the replacement of Alter Hall and the building of a new principal uh, classroom building, to train our eyes on that project with the idea simply of replicating what we have done with this building and Smith Hall across the street and are doing now with respect to the campus residence halls and the dining complex, simply to do that again, in other words, to shoot for civil, silver lead equivalency is not enough. That's clear to me, has been for some time. Um, for a variety of reasons, it seems to me, that, 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 that these buildings as it were, capture a moment in time with a certain level of commitment, and, and now the time has gone forward, and our level of commitment needs to, needs to be restated at a higher level. Um, and the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, before uh, I heard uh, the talk a moment ago, I thought, well, maybe that means gold or platinum or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, I think it's important, um, especially for that building, to be, as it were, a signature building for us because it's the last classroom building we're going to build for a while. I don't know what that while is, but it's at least five years and it's probably much longer than that. And it's going to be, therefore, a building in which teaching happens and learning. But it strikes me that, that not only should teaching and learning happen within the building, but the building itself should be something which teaches and which engages people in a kind of conversation uh, in a thoughtful way about what buildings themselves can be. Uh, so I don't know what that means, whether, uh, I suspect it means that, that we'll use the opportunity of rebuilding uh, Alter Hall to make a step forward and a significant one with respect to, let's say, geothermal uh, energy production or solar or something like that. I don't know, I, uh, I, it'd be nice for me to say, Here's the plan, but there isn't one, you know. Uh, and maybe, um, uh, given the, uh, the presentation we heard a moment ago, um, that uh, we might be thinking in terms of something more dramatic, you know. What if we designed the altar hall replacement like, we, like a tree, you know. <laughs> and um, and uh, in terms of the water and all the rest of, the rest of that. So more on this later, um, but it, it strikes me that we need to, um, uh, what? reimagine what that building might be and then figure out how it is that we get the thing done. Uh, so th both of those, those two projects, it seems to me, uh, better uh, funding uh, the sustainability efforts through uh, initially hiring a director um, and then um, capitalizing on the opportunity for uh, a major building by having um, uh, what, taking a step forward with respect to sustainability issues within the built environment, both of those will function as kind of flywheel efforts that will galvanize a great deal of energy beyond those projects themselves, uh, that, that they'll pay dividends that'll be far richer uh, because of them. They'll help to reset our imagination and focus, give us kind of leadership and vision in terms of where it is we go next. Um, so what is our future beyond that uh, for sustainability, uh, past those two things? Uh, let me give you two analogies, and um, I'll do these fairly briefly. One is community engagement, and the other is diversity and inclusion. Uh, when you look at community engagement, a number of years ago, 15, 16 years ago, we sought to close Ledgewood uh, Avenue down, this is in the residential mall district, to create that green space that's now in the middle of campus. And we discovered at that time that, the, that we indeed had community relations and they were toxic. Um, that, that the neighborhood kind of rose up and really resisted doing that, that, that we had sort of felt all along as if somehow it's okay for us to be kind of our little self-contained university here and not have much to do with the community around us. It has come to the point where these many years later, 
um, that we are now viewed positively uh, by the surrounding communities as a force for good in those neighborhoods, um, such that even the occasional dust up that happens, like when a really angry mayor calls from Norwood last week because of an editorial in the Newswire. I don't know if any of you saw that. Please write the Newswire if you did. Um, that we're able to survive that. <laughs> you know, we're able to survive that. Um, and that's because of a great deal of work along the way that's reflected in all kinds of ways. It's not simply because of Liz Bloom back there and her colleagues in the Community Building Institute, uh, but because of Byron White, now Christine Anderson, who have been leading um, the uh, Eigel Center for Community Engaged Learning that helps to percolate those ideas um, into faculty thinking in the classroom and student experience. It's, of course, Father Ben's great work for generations here in terms of peace and justice issues and getting kids involved. Uh, and the community's work that's now continuing in the Dorothy Day Center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that have happened here in the course of the last 15 years that's taken us from one position with respect to community engagement to a very different uh, uh, situation with respect to community engagement. So too with diversity and inclusion. I would be the first to say that we are far from the promised land with respect to that uh, important issue. But if you were to look back, say, 10 years and ask where we have come, and this is uh, in the uh, Higher Learning Commission self-study, uh, thanks to Grayley, Heron, and Kathy Hart for this, uh, you would see a, a very long inventory of initiatives taken over the course of the last 10 years. Uh, they have included increasing um, the, the, the number and the percentage of students of color uh, in the, uh, in the um, undergraduate student population, overhauling student proce or, um, university processes relating to uh, sexual assault, uh, relaunching the, the Xavier University Women's Center, uh, working with the Xavier Alliance in the last couple of years to be able successfully to have an event called Queer Week, uh, which on a Catholic campus could be a very shocking kind of thing for many people, but we were able to pull it off, uh, and that's a tribute, I think, to a lot of people in their good reason conversation together. Uh, we created a committee of uh, the Board of Trustees to handle diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, and they were insistent on creating a strategic plan for diversity, which aligned with the overall university plan, and then they are instrumental for us in being able to sit down with um, GLBTQ students, for example, and help uh, get the board comfortable with Queer Week, or on the other hand, uh, last year, when we had students of color come to us with that document, Requisition for Change, uh, they were helpful in, in, um, in, in, in uh, listening to the students and assisting us in thinking through as to how to kind of absorb that institutionally. Um, there is the uh, creation of the Earnest Just Society a number of years ago uh, to assist underprepared students, a number of them minority, though not all, uh, to succeed in the pre-med curriculum here such that now uh, we get students of color into medical and dental schools, and it's a tremendous success for us all, I think, and Janice Walker uh, and others work so very hard on that. Uh, and then, of course, there's this new core requirement that just got passed, itself a kind of uh, witness to culture change that's, hit, that's uh, happened here over a, uh, a good long period of time. I cite these two examples because it strikes me that the process of getting to where we want to be with respect to sustainability is like the process of getting to where we want to be with community engagement or with diversity and, and inclusion. That is to say, you begin with a certain base of assets, the things that you have and that you do, the people who are here, the, the, the activities that go on already, in, but though in a disconnected way, that could be pulled together in some fashion so as to help things move forward. Taking uh, those assets that you have to begin with and adding additional assets to them uh, through uh, university support, uh, uh, and uh, that comes in a variety of ways. Those two things together kind of help create the culture change that you need to make these efforts uh, sustainable, uh, no matter what they are, such that what happens ultimately is that these things become markers of what we do and who we are. Um, one of the things that struck me several years ago when I um, inventoried the faculty and staff to see what they were doing in terms of community engagement activities was that I was struck at the sheer volume of them. Um, just the, the incredible number of faculty and staff who make engagement simply a part of how they think now. That's a, a kind of place that we want to get to, it seems to me, with sustainability. Well, why is sustainability like these other two things, like community engagement, like um, 
diversity and inclusion. Because I say, I would say, sustainability, like those other two things, flows fundamentally from the heart of this institution as a Jesuit and Catholic university. Um, that it is impossible nowadays, and will be increasingly impossible, to imagine a Jesuit Catholic university which does not take this issue seriously, make choices with respect to it, and act accordingly. Uh, and that those choices are reflected um, in the most um, important of uh, university documents, university strategic plans, for example, on the one hand, operating budgets on the other, where we encapsulate what our values are because we're, we've decided that we're going to fund them and do them. At um, a uh, conference last April in Mexico City called Networking Jesuit Higher Education, Shaping the Future for a Humane, Just, Sustainable Globe, uh, the present uh, uh, Superior General of the Jesuits, Father Adolfo Nicolás, uh, cited specifically a passage from the 35th General uh, Congregation of the Society of Jesus, where when he said, quote, he called Jesuits to renew a common responsibility for the entire world and its development in a sustainable and life-giving way, close quote. And then, um, sometime later in his talk, imagined uh, three different consortia of, in, of groups uh, drawn from across the spectrum of Jesuit schools worldwide and called for um, the second of those consortia to be focused on our shared concern about global environmental degradation which affects more directly and painfully the lives of the poor with a view to enabling a, a more sustainable future. Uh, in that brief comment, you can see how Father Nicolas wires together a, a variety of things, the, the uh, uh, Jesuit commitment uh, to uh, a faith that does justice, uh, that has been part of our bloodstream for a number of years and that came into the university bloodstream in a very powerful way in the year 2000 when his predecessor, Father Peter Hans Kolbenbach, spoke about the importance of justice in Jesuit higher education at the University of Santa Clara in the fall of 2000. Uh, but as well then melds that uh, to this growing uh, sensibility with respect to uh, sustainability and environmental degradation, as he calls it, by, by citing the very obvious fact that it is the poor who are, who are hurt the most, um, potentially, in all of this. And so, in sum, uh, where does all this leave us? Where will it go? Uh, my hope is that, is that in a series of ways that the university is going to have to both kind of sponsor on the one hand and encourage on the other, sponsor through funding, encouraging uh, through, um, in a variety of ways, your own activity and support, that what we'll see over time is that the group of people in this room uh, who are a handful of folks committed to uh, sustainability issues here on the campus will multiply and multiply and multiply as such that it becomes simply the way in which we think about things um, in general, what, whatever those things might be. Uh, this is going to be a very important element for us moving forward. We are in a propitious time to have these conversations, I think, as you know, uh, if you looked at my um, uh, State of the University address, there's a number of very important planning uh, efforts going on during the course of this year, which will themselves be woven together more tightly into some kind of broader university plan next year, uh, once we have a new provost who's gotten on board and the like. I cannot help but think um, that this dimension of our lives together will be a thread that weaves its way through that plan in multiple kinds of ways. I'm grateful to you for all you have done uh, for uh, the university th in this particular way and in many other ways, of course, as well. I look forward to working with you in the uh, days to come. Thank you.